Hello everybody, uh, Dr. Rick here dropping in on you. Hope everybody is getting your week off to a great start. Hope you enjoyed your extended weekend. Those of you who had extended weekends, uh, had an extended weekend. Um, before I get started, I want to remind everybody, look, we are in the midst of a fundraiser, an ongoing fundraiser uh, to support the work that we do. Uh, for the community, for our race, for those in need um, of many services. In, also, uh, our research center, uh, which has logged thousands upon thousands of hours of research. Me personally, uh, I'm at 80,000 hours of research directly associated with uh, the enigmatic issues that plague the black community, uh, and we are far beyond that totally. Uh, we also have a think tank that's been pushing now for close to 15 years. We have many services from Black Man Lead uh, to services that uh, reach out to uh, those who have suffered from childhood sexual abuse, domestic abuse, mental health, and so forth. Uh, many of you have reached out and asked for help, and we have been there. So, again, we need your support. With that being said, look in the description box at the top and you'll see how you can support the work we do with it. Now, uh, yesterday, I was it yesterday or Sunday? I think maybe Sunday. I posted an intro for this week's series. Last week's series was on the miseducation of black youth in America. Now, obviously, we're going to double back because we didn't even scratch the surface of that. We'll double back uh, some weeks down the line and compounded but I wanted to get as much out on it so that you can look at and see in concession uh, what we're facing in that area this week is about uh, the impact of multi-generational trauma on the black community uh, one of my most extensive examinations into the psychology, the sociology, the economical impact, and the historical, overall historical impact of, has been in the research and examination of multi-generational trauma. Matter of fact, things that come as ancillary discoveries come as my look into multi-generational transmission of trauma, my understanding of adverse childhood experiences comes from looking into trauma and discovering epigenetics and its influence, not only on trauma, not only on mental health, but also on the physiological overall health outcomes of the lives of the people that are impacted by trauma, even during childhood. So I've been doing this for some time. And the first thing that we have to do in this first session is sort of lay out some ground rules. So we're going to talk about trauma. We're going to talk about the many implications, the uh, the mechanisms, the machinations, the uh, systemic uh, forces at play that not only have played a role in traumatizing us, but in tr traumatic re-injury. And I'm going to explain some of these terms that will be used over and over again. Uh, but Traumatic re-injury is a big thing. Dr. Jardigrew talked about that in post-traumatic slave syndrome, but I'm going to give you a new way of looking at uh, this trauma. Post-traumatic slave syndrome is a play on post-traumatic uh, uh, post -traumatic stress disorder, which is uh, a form of traumatiz traumatization that normally comes from being in a traumatic event. So normally you get PTSD from one traumatic experience. Uh, what we're gonna talk about is stack trauma or, or more technically complex trauma. Complex trauma is the succession of traumatic experiences stacked on top of each other in succession. Uh, it can be the same experience like being sexually assaulted multiple, multiple times or it can be a cascade of things like what we've experienced as blacks. Everything from being enslaved uh, to being lynched uh, to being economically castrated uh, and all down the line, all the things, the serial force displacement and so many other things that we're going to cover and talk about. 
And so complex trauma is more in line of what we do, but we are experiencing it on a collective level. The collectivism within it uh, only serves to reinforce it because we together talk about consistently what's happened to us, what's going wrong with us, reinforcing the trauma without ever examining or looking for solutions and talking about solutions. Whatever you focus on, whatever you give the more attention to, you feel the most. So we are literally anchoring our trauma by complaining about it instead of looking for solutions and healing and responsibilities. Some things that we're gonna to have to work on, we're gonna talk about that, but the first rule that we're gonna have in this discussion is that while we're going to talk about and explore and examine deeply uh, the many facets of trauma and multi-generational trauma and how it is transmitted by, uh, generationally, uh, trauma can never be used as an excuse for the lack of positive outcomes in our lives. It doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It doesn't mean that it didn't impact us. What it means is that at some point we're going to be responsible for the outcomes of our lives regardless to what's happened and what's going on. So with that understood, we will not be engaging in this for the purpose of coming up with reasons why we are not where we should be. What it should be used for is an understanding of why we behave and do some of the things we do so that we know the manners and ways that we can work to change that. So that's gonna be the first rule. The next rule is this is a positive engagement, an examination of what's possible when we understand. The goal of knowledge is to discover so that in that discovery you can create outcomes. Now when you don't do that when you only look at it for a reason to be divisive for a reason to sit up and talk about all the things that you can find that's wrong with something but never looking at how you can fix it then it stops being an instrument of growth and change and it starts to become again an anchor into an undesirable situation so again the goal is discovery for aware of, for the purpose of awareness for the purpose of evaluation and the development of strategies and plans for change um and so that's going to be the ground rules what we're going to talk about uh starting tomorrow is the path from slavery to current day. So we're gonna talk about everything that's happened from path to slavery today. We're gonna to talk about how it's impacted us socially, economically, uh, historically, academically, and uh, in the way of our mental health. And then we're going to undress how we can systematically and strategically move to change it. Uh, my discoveries have been that, uh, and it, it all started for me with uh, the argument that was being pushed in the 90s that, hey man, it's been 100 years already, get over it. Uh, it's been 100, at that time I think 120 years, 130 years, something like that. And it was get over it. And, you know, slavery is over with. And the thing is, you, you never hear anyone ever telling a Jew to get over the Holocaust. That's been, you know, uh, less than 100 years ago. But you never hear anybody saying that. That's not allowed and it's not expected. Um, the thing is, it's not about getting over it. Uh, it's about understanding it. It's about being aware of it. It's about saying, okay, this is what I am going to do about it. And that's the difference. When I looked into it, the difference between blacks and Jews in how we fared, obviously, number one is they received reparations. Number two, they received support. Number three, people rallied around them. We have consistently been uh, at the negative end of assault, attack, mishandling, misrepresentation, misguidance, and so much more. The thing is, our experience never ended. They keep talking about slavery ended in 1865. But the black, the negative black experience in America didn't end in 1865. We went straight out of slavery into 12 years of reconstruction. And we're going to talk about what reconstruction is. Uh, they try to put a pretty penny on it, make it sound sweet. But reconstruction was one of the most dangerous times for blacks in the South ever. Because this was the first 12 years uh, of a period when the lives of blacks didn't have any value because they were no longer property. As a matter of fact, they were viewed as threats because they held the skills. 
they have they held the ability and capacity to build they were the ones being used so uh we were a threat and we uh were being lynch killed mishandled then there were black codes then there was convict leasing then there was redlining then there was in that period and beyond uh Jim Crow segregation and what that entailed and what went on and so many other things along this line that we haven't even gotten to the civil rights era and all the crazy stuff that went on in there where we thought we were gaining ground and we were actually being misled, mishandled and buffered but we're going to get into all of this um, so that we can understand what re-injury is to see what re-injury is okay say for instance everybody's talking about healing so say for instance your trauma is physical in, instead of emotional, instead of psychological, uh, instead of uh, an attack on your identity. It's a physical injury. Somebody takes a baseball bat and hits you in your leg, breaks your leg, right? It's trauma. It's broken. It's going to need to heal. And it's going to need some special care in order to heal, right? Where is the special care after 246 years of child slavery? Where is this mass uh, treatment for trauma? that we have to believe and understand that it, it happened because we can send our soldiers overseas for a six to nine month tour uh, during combat uh, combat time. And the things that they witness, they come back and they're not the same. They need treatment. They're talking about being, and, 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 and realistically, they are traumatized. They are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Okay, that's six to nine months. We're talking, 246 years of being in a system where you are uh, either kidnapped from your country and brought into it and then after the transatlantic slave trade was shut down now you're being bred into it so you're born into it and then you are constantly being pushed and pressed so 246 years of that now you come out of it and they're saying okay we let you go you're free you're supposed to get 40 acres and a mule so that you can establish yourself you can build yourself they decided they weren't going to do that lincoln was killed jackson comes in and says i'm not giving them jack so now you're out there and to top it off you go through 12 years of reconstruction what is reconstruction just a real quick thing reconstruction was this point in time where uh, clandestine groups in the south like the Klan and other uh, groups rode and, and terrorized military installations from the Union Army the, or the North that had set up in the South to keep order. They would terrorize them, burn them, shoot people, uh, destroy property. And it got to the point where it was so costly in life and property that the North withdrew. Literally, the Union Army withdrew from the South, left all these slaves that were freed because of this, this, this war. It really had nothing to do with us. Uh, it was not a war on, about morality, but this is what happened. So then, uh, left them down here. So then what happened? Slowly but surely, the South returned to its ante antebellum roots. The only thing that didn't return to business as usual was slavery as it was then. This is where you really need to re read slavery by another name because they just found new ways to do it. And one of the ways was convict leasing. Convict leasing was, we're going to make everything that a vagrant group would do illegal including vagrancy so if you didn't have a job in a place to stay over two million slaves freed in the south record on on record uh probably far more than that but on record 200 two million uh two million slaves free no jobs being offered because of the black codes limited what kind of jobs they could take to ensure that whites had jobs now because we could no longer live off the black and the the backs and the labor of slaves so now these things are happening now uh you know equate that to somebody while you're still trying to heal from that bat injury to your leg comes along and hits you again not only are you not going to heal it's going to call an additional injury it's going to create more trauma and that trauma is compounded more capillaries damaged more bone damage uh more structural issues the chance of you actually getting your leg back to where it was initially is diminished now here comes again hits this is what we've dealt with for 150 plus years and yet everybody's saying get over it and some kind of way we got to figure out how to manage it because if we don't they're going to kill us they're going to destroy us they have created through migration a situation where we are no longer relevant and necessary 
and the political elections are proving this. So what do the what do we do? We become relevant by economic power, about strategic social movement. We become our own autonomy so that we represent ourselves, so that we create for ourselves, so that we have value within ourselves and value in the system. We have to insulate ourselves. That's a, that's a strategy that cannot be ignored and it has to be done and we are running out of time. But anyway, the, the thing that we need to understand is trauma is real. It can be passed down generationally. I'm gonna explain this more uh, on tomorrow. Uh, it can be passed down uh, by way of epigenetics, uh, it, ex it is experienced consistently epigenetically. I'm gonna explain that. And it also is being pushed social, uh, through social learning theory and the practice of traumatic, uh, indu trauma-inducing behavior. We tend to do things to our own that's done to us. We're gonna talk about all those things, but the thing is, we definitely are going to have to visit this. We're gonna to have to prepare ourselves. We're gonna to have to be ready to do something to change where we're at. I'm excited about these series that we're gonna do uh, where I get to unfold uh, years and years and years of work that I've put in my books, that I've put in academic papers, that I've written in articles, but we're going to just talk about them in lay terms and kind of roll through them and talk because we need to understand what's going on. We need to understand that this isn't a joke. This isn't something most of us are in a very precarious situation because we've been lured or lulled into this idea that we have made it, that we're good, that we're cool, that we're safe, and we have never been more in jeopardy than we are right now. But anyway, that is where I'm going to cut it off right now. I'm going to get out of here. But again, if you believe in the work that we're doing, if you believe uh, in what we are functioning as a catalyst of change, go into the description box and choose a way to give and support our work so that we can continue and not only continue, but to expand. There are programs that need to be national in every major uh, to mid-sized city, period. Um, and on that note, I'm gonna get out of here. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day.